church family, if you're a guest with us today, we want to take the next couple of minutes to share with you some of the ways that you can get connected and involved in our church. One of the best ways is to join a life group or a class. You can find a complete list of our 65 life groups or classes on our website. They meet here in the building and also in the Fargo-Moorhead area throughout the week. Pick up the events brochure at guest services for more details. And hey, if you're a parent of a child, we have an exciting children's ministry for your children to be a part of during our Sunday morning services. And we also have a nursery available during our Sunday evening service. If you're looking for more places for your child, ages five through fifth grade, to get connected, our children's ministry is Wednesday activities during the school year, which begin again this August. If you're a youth, we have our youth group that meets during the summer months on Wednesday nights at 7 p.m. for junior high through senior high. Enter through door seven and I would love to see you there. If you're in college, we have a great ministry called Chi Alpha. During the summer months, they meet here in our building as well in the Student Ministry Center on Tuesday night at 7 p.m. They also have college small groups that meet on or around the campus. Check out their website at fmchialpha.com for the times and locations of those services and small groups. If you're a young adult, then we'd love to encourage you to be a part of our young adult ministry called The Canvas. It meets right here in our building Thursday nights at 7 p.m. in the Student Ministry Center. And don't be alarmed by all these ages. We also have something for adults and even senior adults. Check them out on our website. We have adult classes, we have life groups, and other activities. Once again, thank you so much for joining us for our Sunday services. If you have any questions, do not hesitate to talk to a pastor or our hospitality team out in the lobby. service is about ready to start in a minute, so if you're in our lobby, please make your way on in. If at any point you have questions about anything here at First Assembly, don't hesitate to talk to a pastor or our hospitality team located in the lobby. Hey, if you're a parent of a child, we want to encourage you that if your child gets restless during the service, we have parent-child rooms on either side of the sanctuary which have TVs, so you will not miss any part of the service. And better yet, we have an incredible children's ministry where your kids can enjoy an age-appropriate service created just for them. So as a parent, you can rest assured that your little one is having fun while you're in the main auditorium. It's our hope here at First Assembly that from the moment you arrive in our parking lot to the spirit-led moment at the altar, you will experience God in every moment and that you live life differently because of Him. As a church, we believe that the Bible is the foundation of everything we do. So as you go about your week, be in the Word so that it drives your character and empowers your relationships. Thanks for joining us for our services. Good morning, everyone, and we welcome you this first Sunday of meeting at 930, and we are so glad that you're here with us this morning. We look forward to gathering together every Sunday morning 
to come together to worship our Savior, of course, but to gather together as brothers and sisters together. And as we do, we just want to encourage you to enter in right from the very beginning. And if you're a guest with us, thank you for being here with us this morning, and we're honored that you are here with us. Throughout this worship time, you'll notice on the side there's some folks that will be standing there that have, if for any reason you would like prayer, feel free to just make your way down there and they would love to pray with you during that time and pray and agree with you for any prayer needs you might have. But right now, I want to ask you, would you just stand and as you stand, you'll take note, of course, as you're looking, you might have just noticed this big section over here. We are in the midst of uh, uh, putting a sprinkling system into the church, so some things had to be moved around. So if that's your usual seat, we know that might be a difficult time for you this morning, not being able to be there, okay? But just know that's just a temporary thing, but uh, if you're wondering what that is all about. But for now, would you take a moment and just walk around this place? Go greet somebody, say hello to somebody, and welcome somebody, and get to know somebody you've not met before.
One of the opportunities we come together to do during this worship time this morning is to honor praise to Him by participating in the what we call the Lord's Supper, communion time. The ushers are going to be begin to make their way down front here, and we would like to serve each one of you this morning the elements of communion. And we do this because Jesus did this with his disciples, his followers, before he left this earth. And he went to die on that cross and then ascended into heaven. But he reminded his disciples, he said, do this as often as a reminder of what my body, my blood will represent to you and represents to you. So we're going to continue to worship God. The ushers are going to distribute the elements. And if you're a believer, we have, we have an open communion here. If you're a, a follower of Jesus Christ, you've made Jesus Christ your Savior, you can participate with communion because that's what the Scripture says. We must be born again. So as they're participating and as, as they're, they're passing these elements, we continue to worship, continue to worship in honor God, and I'll come back, hold on to the elements, and I'll come back in just a few moments, and we'll celebrate this together as a, a family together.
hold in your hands these elements that represent the blood and the broken body of Jesus Christ. When he was with his disciples, of course, he had a loaf of bread or, and he had uh, some wine. And he said these would be the ingredients. And he wanted them to participate together with him for a specific reason so that they would be reminded again, as I've already said, of what he was accomplishing for us on the cross. As a result of his broken body, we have forgiveness of sin. We have salvation. We have healing that can be made complete in what he accomplished. And through his blood, forgiveness of sin that touches our lives and changes us forever. So he would, as he was with them, he took the bread. We have this little wafer here that represents that bread. And he took that and he said to them, take eat as a reminder. And he took the bread and he broke it with them. This little wafer, would you just break it right now as a, an example of what it was? That sound of that breaking just again reminds us of what Jesus did for us. Let's eat the bread together. And then the scripture says he took the cup and he did pass a cup amongst them. And he said, this represents my blood. Because of what he accomplished by his shed blood, we have forgiveness of sins. And the power of God that is set free to set us free. And we can have the joy of the Lord and the peace of God that will rule in our lives as a result of what he has accomplished for us on that cross. So together we celebrate as a family of believers together, yes, of what Jesus accomplished for us during that, that time together with his disciples, but what he accomplished a few days later by giving his life for us. Let's take this cup and drink this together. Now let's again just begin to lift our hands and let's just worship him and thank him for what he has done and what he has accomplished in our lives. We are so blessed, Father, for what you have accomplished in our lives. And we thank you for, for our forgiveness of our sin. That God, that the joy of the Lord can be our strength. The peace of God can rule in our lives in a victorious way. We are so thankful. We are so thankful. We praise you, Lord Jesus. Carlina, lead us in a song, this, once again, this chorus. Let's just lift our hands all across this place. Just lifting up praise as we do that for what Jesus accomplished for us. that we have, that our sin is forgiven as we are washed white as snow. Let's just give thanks for him. Would you do that? Lift up a shout of praise and just let's just worship him for who he is in our lives. Hallelujah. Well, we've come together this morning and we are here gathered to praise the Lord, to receive from the word this morning and what God wants to accomplish in our lives. And we are thankful for this opportunity. You may go ahead and be seated. And as you are, just want to draw your attention to a few things and just encourage you. Yes, we are just so honored that you are here with us. If this is your first uh, experience here at First Assembly, thank you for being together with us. We have, uh, and uh, as guests you may not know this, but others will, we have a brand new connection card. And you will find it in the book rack just in front of you there. We want to encourage each of you to take this. We'd love to connect with you is exactly what it says. So if you're uh, a guest with us this morning, we're encouraging you to fill this out. But not only our guests, we're asking everyone in the place this morning, would you fill this out? One of the great things we do as a staff every Monday is when we get together or our staff meeting following a, a Sunday service is we pray over these prayer requests. And you'll find on there not only a place to put your name and, and information like that, but also your prayer requests or praise reports. So often we get praise reports that just bless us so much because 
it demonstrates that God is at work in our family here as a church. And so take a few moments to fill that out. And in just a moment when we receive the offering, we're going to encourage you to just place it in the offering baskets as they go by. Also, we just want to let you know of something else. So if you're a first-time guest or you'd like to meet with our pastor, Pastor Bob and Pastor Sharon, there's a great opportunity right following this service. All you have to do is go out the double doors at the back there, turn left, and then turn immediate right into the fireside room. And they are there. We have coffee and some other refreshments for you. And we would just love for you to take advantage of that opportunity. Find out more about who we are as a church and as a, a, a gathering together. But meet our pastor and his wife and get to know what God is doing here at First Assembly. In addition to that, if you want to know more about First Assembly, we have this incredible uh, events uh, brochure that we put together. It is very thick this this uh, season. It's got so many things that are going to be coming up throughout the, the fall and all the things and small groups and, and children's youth and young adult ministries and college ministry events going on. So you can pick one of these up following the service as you're uh, leaving the auditorium. You'll find it right back there on one of the tables there. And so we want to encourage you to take advantage of that as well and uh, take that home with you and be aware of what's taking place. I'm going to ask the ushers if they would come at this time. This is also a time that we continue to bless and, and worship God with our giving and our ties to the Lord. And you will also find in the, the book rack in front of you there an, an offering envelope if you would need that. But we encourage all believers uh, to uh, give. The Bible says that we're blessed for our giving. And as we've come together, we've learned that as a family that giving is a part of our worship experience. And so we want to encourage you to do that. There are different ways that you can do that, whether through texting or, uh, or through the uh, envelope. Uh, just feel free to take advantage of those opportunities, and uh, we encourage you to do just that. I want to pray over the offering at this time, but also want to pray over the message of the word that Pastor Bob will be bringing to us in a few moments here. Let's pray together. Father. We are so thankful that as we've gathered together this morning, there is already a, a, just a, an incredible awareness of your presence here. Lord, we come together to worship you and we lift you up. And Lord, through your word, would you now speak to us and challenge us. And Father, as we now return to you uh, our offerings and gifts to you, Father, we pray that you would bless these gifts to the furthering of your kingdom, both in this community, but around the world as we give to missions as well. And we are so thankful, Father, that you have blessed us in so many different ways that we are able to give in this way. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. As you're giving, just turn your attention to the screen for the video announcements coming up. Hey, everybody. We're so glad you're here today. On your way into the sanctuary, you received one of our fall events brochures. It looks like this. And it's a full list of all of our life groups and classes, as well as special events, upcoming sermon series, baptisms and baby dedications, as well as additional resources and activities for all of our leaders. All of this information is also available on our website if you prefer to access it through your mobile device. Beginning on September 7th, all of our life groups and classes launch in the fall. So take some time to look down the various opportunities in the brochure and see if you have any questions. You can stop by guest services. Okay, did you all get that? <laughs> oh, good morning, good morning. Hey, uh, we are, we're also live casting and recording, so uh, that's why you see the, uh, the screen behind me. Uh, do I look good from behind? Can you check that? Oh, that's not what that's there for. Oh, we prayed over the message. We begin a brand new and a very exciting series for me. I want to ask you this question. I'm sure the answer is going to be yes. Have you ever been driving in your car, windows open, on a lovely Sunday night, and then your car hits a skunk? Can I get a witness? I mean, who is it, right? You know, your vehicle probably got sprayed. If it happened, you'll know it right away. And so will everybody else who follows after you for a long, long time, or 
if a, a skunk may be wrangled with something nearby the road and you drive by that spot, you know, you can identify it, you know, and right away everybody in the car starts talking. Am I right? I mean, there's comments because something has changed in the atmosphere. And every family has that one uncle. If he's in the car, he's going to say, it wasn't me, it wasn't me, right? And then you'll remember that smell. There's nothing like it, and you'll immediately identify, yeah, there's been a skunk nearby. When I was a boy, my dog Rex wrangled with a skunk, and none of us would ever forget it, especially Rex, okay? And uh, back, back then, I mean, when your animals got, you know, in, involved with the skunk, you'd, the remedy was to take, you know, the tomato juice, which we grew our own tomatoes, and we canned our own tomatoes, and there was poor Rex. He was just a mutt, you know what I mean? And we're trying to wash him down, and tomatoes are dripping off his, off his you know, snout and everything, and we're just like, are we sure this is going to help at all? And for a long time, we knew when Rex was around. You know what I'm saying? Something was added to the atmosphere, despite our, 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 our uh, tomato juice cures. A month after we got Rex smelling mainly normal, we had friends uh, pull up, and we had a long country driveway, farmhouse, and uh, when they came to a halt in front of the house, a skunk odor came with them. They had just experienced a close encounter of the skunk kind, okay? And so they, uh, they, they just, like, didn't know what to do. They said, let's just go to the owners anyway. We came out, and we all caught a whiff, and then, of course, we all started in, right? Like, hey, no need to knock, Merle. You've announced yourself already. Love your cologne. Hey, park that car down the road. Uh, you know, Grandma, like, come in and have a little something. We have coffee, lemonade, brownies, and some tomato juice for the Chevy. You never know. It worked for Rex, right? They knew about Rex and couldn't resist. You people should be used to the smell by now. After a while, you hardly notice it. Your dog got in a, a little tussle with the skunk, didn't he? And they would say, we're just freshening up your yard to remind you of the real fresh smell that, and on and on it went. I noticed that when the car pulled up, Rex disappeared. There was a strong association with uh, that smell, that atmosphere. I actually didn't see him around until the next morning atmosphere. Even a dog has learned how to avoid a certain atmosphere. Do you know you can feel an atmosphere in a room? and you remember it? Have you ever walked into a room and the people were fighting before you got there? They stopped, you know, they put on a plastic smile and said, good to see you, but you still knew something was wrong because it was lingering in the atmosphere. If you walk up to somebody's door, I'll go to people's houses, and before I even knock on the door, I hear them inside and they're laughing and carrying on and having so much fun, and you can feel that atmosphere as well. See, Jesus was creating an atmosphere that people were responding to, and we're going to read all about it. Let's start in Luke chapter 5, verse 15. However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed of him of their infirmities. Something was in the air. Call it an anointing. I call it an atmosphere. I call it an environment. I call it a piece of heaven on earth. And as Jesus was ministering, there was healing in the air. Jesus was teaching, and people were receptive. Maybe difficult times would follow, and indeed they did. But for this moment and for this time, there was something of God that was touching people and radically transforming their bodies and their souls. So we're talking about atmosphere. Let's define atmosphere. Atmosphere is the invisible but discernible, intangible feeling in a room, a home, a business, or a region in response to a prevailing spirit. We'll leave it up there for a moment. 
Thanks to Bishop Michael Pitts who got me thinking all about this. Atmosphere. You know it's there. It's understandable. Even if you can't see it, it is there. And it is a response to a prevailing spirit. So when Jesus was ministering, there was an anointing upon him for healing. That would be the prevailing spirit, and people were receiving healing. So let's get into some main points. Number one, God made us with the ability to discern atmospheres. As human beings, we were created for an atmosphere. God has an amazing atmosphere waiting for us, and we can discern and understand what's in the air, what's in the atmosphere. Luke 5, 17. Now it happened on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and teachers of the law sitting by who had come out of every town of Galilee, Judea, and Jerusalem. Now notice this. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Dr. Luke is recording this. He understands about physical remedies and physical healing, and he also understands there's that. I would be the last person to say, don't see a doctor. See a doctor. They're good people. They're healers. But pray to Jesus Christ, the healer, first. Amen? Because Luke, the beloved physician, understands that there's something else here that Jesus Christ has created or there has come upon him an environment of healing. And the prevailing condition, the doctor says, at least right now, the way the Holy Spirit is moving in that moment of time was to bring healing to people. He taught, oh, often he taught, he was teaching, but the, the disciple says, there's healing right here in the room. We'd put it that way. On this occasion, notice that there were Pharisees, 6,000 or so in number in Jesus' day, and the Pharisees would be called like segregationists, I suppose, because they wanted so intently to follow God and to serve God that they wanted to separate themselves from any contamination. They wanted to obey the law so completely that they had the law and then around the law, they put a hedge, meaning they went further than the law required. The law had a lot of requirements, but they said, just so we don't mess up in any way unintentionally, let's create a safety zone. We don't even want to get into the safety zone before we hit a violation of the law. Then there were the teachers there. These were the theologians and the lawyers of the day. And their mission in this moment was to scrutinize Jesus and look for faults. They were there because they had spent their life being religious. They, they had scruples, and they're going to miss something. They're going to miss what God was doing, unless Jesus calls their attention to it. I, uh, I remember talking to a realtor a while ago, uh, and the realtor said this, you know, when people go to look at a house and they're interested in buying, uh, they want their dream house, but they're looking for faults. I said, what do you mean? They're looking for flaws. They're looking for anything that is wrong. That's why when people sell a home, they try to create curb appeal. They try to make everything look right. That's why they paint the walls. You know, that's why they say, you know, I should have done this 35 years ago, but now that we're selling it, we're fixing the house up for the next people. Because there's so much at stake, people don't want to make a mistake in the way that they buy their home. And there was so much at stake here, and so many people were starting to follow Jesus, and they were hearing all about healings and teaching and everything. But their frame of reference is, yeah, but let's see if he breaks the law. Let's see if he breaks the teaching of the law. I mean, there are always people like that. You know, we call it a pharisaical attitude. Their attitude to the masses is, I'm okay, you're not okay, try harder. You never want to be in a church like that. Give me an amen, somebody. 
You're not the sorry, you just have to try harder. No, work harder, earn more, try harder. You work from grace, you don't work for grace. Well, these are the people that always found something wrong, and yet at the same time that's going on, healing, a climate of restoration is activated as well. See, I believe climate means something. It's the general weather conditions that prevail in an area over a long period. If you're in the Red River Valley, we have a climate, and you invite your friends to come here during the summer to enjoy our climate, because what predominates typically in the summer is what we've been enjoying right now. It's the average weather. Last night I was in Gooseberry Park. We had a wonderful celebration of Redemption Road's first year. God is doing so much. The press was there. You probably saw on the news last night, if you watched the news, uh, wonderful articles, wonderful coverage from the reporters that were there telling all about the goodness of God and what God was doing. And you know, it was a beautiful night. It was one of those summer nights where it was warm but no humidity. Amen? And the night before, they had been spraying for mosquitoes. Hallelujah. So none of them were there singing Power in the Blood. That's good. And uh, we had the coffee going, and there was a silent auction, and there were testimonies. Pastor Stephen Widner was, was singing. Pastor Travis Lynn gave a great testimony and a message. And it was just one of those times where you said, this just feels good. Weather-wise, but the spiritual climate felt terrific. There's a climate. Sometimes people talk about a climate of political unrest. I thought somebody would say amen right now. <laughs> and if you see on the screen that verse, and the power of the Lord was present to heal them. Hmm. Them. Everybody there and the Pharisees and the teachers of the law. The call of God to them was not come and be skeptical. It was come and be healed. You see, there can be a prevailing presence, whether good or bad, and you can go along with it or not because you get to create your own climate. And it seems like the Pharisees and the teachers of the law had a microclimate. I mean, everybody else was seemingly enjoying what God was doing, but, but they were resistant, and they were questioning, and they had things in their past that would cause them to be that way. While other people are responding positively, they're not there. Luke 5, 18. Then behold, men brought on a bed a man who was paralyzed, whom they sought to bring in and lay before him. Uh, Mark says there were four men who brought a paralyzed man all the way to Jesus because they said, if the prevailing climate is healing, doesn't it just make sense to bring our friend, our relative, however they were connected, let's get in that climate. Let's bring him. They were discerning the atmosphere. And so there they go, and right away you're going to notice something. Verse 19 of Luke 5, And when they could not find how they might bring him in because of the crowd, they went up on the housetop and let him down with his bed through the tiling into the midst before Jesus. Let me tell you something. When God is moving, there are always obstructions to getting into the prevailing atmosphere of God. There always will be, and most of them are inside of us. You have a man, he's a paralytic. That is his condition, and it is keeping him from running to Jesus Christ. It is keeping him from following and following him. It's keeping him from doing what the woman with an issue of blood did. She said, I am going to finagle my way through this crowd, and if I can just touch a little bit of his garment, I'll be healed. He couldn't do that. The truth of it is, our own internal spiritual conditions 
Our own climate sometimes prohibits us from locking into the climate that Jesus Christ gives. Sometimes people get in the way and they contribute to the problem. But sometimes people help you to get to Jesus Christ. The truth of it is we don't do this together. If we create a climate, if we want a climate of God moving, we need to do that together. And thank God, that we can bring our family and our friends to where Jesus is moving. I'm going to tell you something. God's prevailing climate in heaven never changes. And he wants to bring his climate here to earth, and he always gives you a way to get there. I don't like self-improvement. I don't like the word self-improvement because it says everything I need is inside myself. And I think all of us know when it comes to spiritual issues, everything we need is outside of us. It's in Jesus Christ. And we say, Jesus, please come in because I need something I don't have. If you think everything you need is inside yourself, well, then stop breathing and just use your own oxygen for a while. It won't take long before you realize, I need to take in from outside myself it can be your undoing if you don't let other people do life with you God will make sure that you come to some point in time where you need other believers it's not wrong you're not having to be a self-made man you're not needing to be a lone ranger you don't have to do this alone four men said we're gonna do everything we can to help one man and somehow, if God is moving, there will be a way for us to get there with him. There needs to be an absolute determination in our hearts, in this place, in this church, that we will do everything we can to get people into the presence of Jesus Christ, to bring them to Christ. Jesus came to seek and to save what was lost. The apostles put it this way when a bunch of people were trying to come to Jesus and have faith in him and others were interfering. In Acts 15, verse 19, they said this, It is my judgment, therefore, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. We all need to be stretcher bearers. So uh, these guys... Go to the rooftop. Now, it sounds strange to us, but in Palestine, they sometimes had external stairs or ladders, and you could get up on the roof and catch a breeze. And sometimes, even when there's a funeral, they would actually lower a coffin through the ceiling. So it, it sounds strange to us, but it, it could be done then. And these men just followed the same procedure. But it was bizarre, wasn't it? You have the dignitaries in there, the Pharisees, the teachers, the, law, the hungry people. Everybody's mixed in together. And uh, what next? No, it's not a crying baby interrupting the service. It's a bunch of guys digging through the roof. And then they do that, and they lower their friend down. Their intention becomes obvious to everybody. They just lower a paralyzed man down in front of Jesus, you know? You can just see it happening. Let's not go to that part of the roof. No, let's dig this part up right where Jesus is. He's going to be hard to miss. How many know it's real hard to miss somebody hanging from the ceiling on a cot? It sounds like a youth convention, Pastor Cal. I tell you. Oh, you've done that already. All right. Come this year, five people hanging from God's. And Jesus perceived what's going on. In Luke 5, 20, we read this. When he saw their faith, he said to them, Man, your sins are forgiven you. Oh, don't miss this. He saw their faith. Their response to what God was doing. If you know what God is doing, just get into it. Jesus will call it faith. He realized they were fighting for someone else. You know what I believe about faith? It's not just belief about Jesus or good feelings about Jesus. It is the determination to allow nothing 
to impede access to Jesus, either for ourselves or for others. That is faith. That is working faith. That is real faith. That is faith that says, if Jesus is moving and there's a prevailing condition of heaven, I want to be a part of it, and I want to bring as many people into it as possible. And no matter what stands in the way, we're going to get in the presence of the healer, the Savior. God will always make a way. He'll always make a way. And so while we pray, I want to encourage you, as we pray to seek God, we need to make a way. These guys talked about it. I assume they prayed. But what they decided to do was intercessory because they said, we're going to take this guy who can't go to Jesus. Maybe this man that was paralyzed didn't have any faith. Some of us give up too easily. Well, you know, my friend doesn't want anything to do with Jesus. Yeah, but Jesus wants a lot to do with him. And Jesus congratulated the men that brought their friend. He said, it's your faith. He was responding to their faith. Do you know how hard it is sometimes when you prayed and sought God and nothing's going your way? Have you ever had somebody come to you and say, I'm going to bear you, our family's going to bear you, our life group is going to bear you, and we're going to carry you in Jesus' name to a place where you can have healing and restoration? That is Faith, it's intercession. So D Jesus deals with the spiritual issue first. He's working now from the inside out. Sometimes he works from the outside in. Man, your sins are forgiven you. So, you have a meeting, Jesus keeps teaching. Man's lowered. The Pharisees are looking for a fail, and they said, we have an epic fail here. Look at verse 21 of Luke 5. And the scribes and the Pharisees began to reason, saying, who is this who speaks blasphemies? Who can forgive sins but God alone? You see, a different spirit was working in them. There are Prevailing spirits and counter spirits. Sometimes, as a believer, you're of the counter spirit. We're not of the world, even though we're in the world. Well, here you have sort of the opposite going on. There's this tussle in their hearts. They're thinking this. Jesus knows what they're thinking. He has a word of knowledge. They thought they had caught him. You know what? Isn't it strange? They could have leaned into the prevailing culture, the prevailing climate. They could lean into the moment. Instead, they push back away from it. We don't want anything to do with Jesus. Verse 22, But when Jesus perceived their thoughts, he answered and said to them, Why are you reasoning in your hearts? Can I tell you something? God will speak to people who are doubting him. And today, if you are doubting God, you're here, I'm glad you're here, thank you for showing up, but you have your doubts about this, that, or the other thing. And somebody may have told you, or you might be laboring under the impression because you have what I call honest doubts that God is not going to answer your prayer. God will speak to you in the middle of your doubts. That's what he did for these men. You know, you can always say, God, here I am, and I have my doubts whether you're in existence, which is kind of a weird prayer. But what do you have to lose? If God doesn't exist, you can pray to nothing and no one will know the better, right? On the other hand, if we serve a God who knows your heart and loves you, that's about all it takes. If you're real, show yourself to me. That's how my wife Sharon received Jesus Christ. She looked into heaven once. She had been a VBS teacher, a Sunday school kid. Uh, she was working in a chapel, and she just said, God, if you're real, show me. And God showed her. So they're saying, you know, you can't forgive sins unless you're God, and we don't think he is. Look at verse 23. Which is easier to say, 
your sins are forgiven you, or to say, rise up and walk. So he just carries it. God will prove himself to you. And since the prevailing climate there was of healing, Jesus is using this man as an object lesson. And can't you see, like, his friends and the guy in the mat saying, oh, no, this is some time for a theological debate. You know, I can imagine these four guys saying, yeah, we can carry him. Let's get there and see whatever we can do. And they find these ropes and everything, and they, they do everything. It's a piece of cake. We're going to lower him down, and we're going to be out of here before you know it. Amen. We're going to beat the Baptists to dinner today because we're just going to do it. We're going to go. And so they lower him down. You got him? Yeah, we got him. You know, okay, what's happening? It's like, uh-oh. They're talking theology. And I could just imagine these guys thinking, how long is this going to take? I mean, they're going to go on forever. Didn't Jesus stay like three days once debating theology when he was a kid? Now what's this going to take? You know, and one of them says, hold on, this cord's biting into me, you know. And there's this guy just hanging. They left him hanging. Can you hear those ropes? <laughs> One guy loses a grip. And they're, they're talking theology. I don't know how much longer I can hold on. Call for some guys down. I mean, I can just, I can picture that. You know how I can picture that? I'm a guy. You know, like, right. You know, I, just so many things go on. God will move when there's a humanity in the mix. When there's a bunch of us in the mix, I can imagine the guy that owned the home saying, oh, how am I going to explain this when my wife gets back from visiting her parents? We're going to have a work crew. We're going to clean up this mess. And it's just kind of going on and on and on. But it didn't go on and on and on. I'll tell you something. I have found that God will actually reason with you and speak to you in a way that you get. I know this to be true because the Pharisees and the teachers said this, if you're sick, there is sin. I know people that believe that. They just condemn people that have a problem of sickness. They, they say the only reason there's a sickness is because there is a sin. And so the Pharisees could get by not being all that sympathetic because somebody sinned or maybe his parents sinned. And, you know, it's all because of sin, which is all on him. That was their theology. Now you understand why Jesus is addressing their worldview. He's saying, hey, listen, listen. Your sins are forgiven. Well, of course, if they thought sin put them on that mat, then if Jesus forgave the sin, wouldn't it stand to reason that that man could be forgiven? And so Jesus is leading them somewhere. They were in the room. They were doubters. There were adversaries. But Jesus is saying, please come in. I want you. I want you to be a part of the prevailing culture. Wasn't it good of God to put a paralytic right in front of the Pharisees? It's hard to miss the point. And so that is, that is happening. In Luke 5, 24, we read on, but that you may know that the Son of Man has power on earth to forgive sins. Remember, they connected the two. He said to the man who was paralyzed, I say to you, arise, take up your bed, and go to your house. Immediately he rose up before them, took up what he had been lying on, and departed to his own house, glorifying God. God, what a way to leave church, right? Jesus said, do the impossible. And he did the impossible. You know what? I don't blame him for not hanging around that place. Do you? Before anybody could talk him out of it, before somebody could condemn him, before somebody with an over-religious spirit could pull him back, he said, I am out of here. I'm going to show myself to my family. And verse 26 says this, 
And they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. I mean, they moved a little bit. They didn't know what to do, but they saw a move of God. Let me say this as our second point today. God made us with the ability to be stewards of our atmosphere to be a steward of the atmosphere. This man had a healing, and he said, Jesus told me to walk. I'm going to do the next thing Jesus tells me to do. And he says, gangway, boys, I'm going home. And everybody didn't say, come in, you know, leave here the way you came in. He just, he walked out. Jesus set an atmosphere, and we're to be like him. Uh, back up to Luke 5, 16. Here's the secret. So he himself often withdrew into the wilderness and prayed. Many times Jesus prayed. What was he doing? He was setting his personal climate, his atmosphere. Dr. Luke actually records seven different times where Jesus prayed and none of the other disciples caught that, but he seemed to understand. He seemed to have this discernment about spiritual environments. You see, you will get your atmosphere from something or someone. Something from the outside will get into you. And Jesus operating as an obedient man saying, I will set the tone and the climate for my life. I will serve God. I will leave the people in order to get in the presence of God so I can bring the presence of God back to the people. There's a reason why we pray here all the time, why we pray on Saturday mornings. Uh, Friday night I was here, and there was a group of Chi Alpha people praying for university ministries from 8 to 11 o'clock. They were just seeking God because we're about to ready to start a brand new school year, and they're saying, we need an atmosphere. Amen? An atmosphere. And we are stewards of that atmosphere. Too many times we are like consumers of the atmosphere. I mean, if God's moving, by all means, get into that move of the Holy Spirit. But there does come a time when you need to say, I'm also going to be somebody that creates the atmosphere for someone else. You can only be comfortable so much in your own environment and saying, it's all about me. It's never all about you. Jesus got alone with God to bless the people, and that's what Christians need to be doing. And we go into prayer because we want a great weather forecast. Psalm 150, verse 2 says, Praise him according to his excellent greatness. In other words, your life will be up and down all the time. You'll have good things and bad things. You'll be busy, not so busy, but then super busy again. And we don't tie our climate to the vicissitudes of this life. We tie our personal atmosphere to God. So we praise him according to his excellent greatness. We go into God's presence because it never changes. It's amazing and it's wonderful. Psalm 150 verse 6 says this, let everything that has breath praise the Lord. And you say, at all times, I can be somebody who praises God. I can determine the prevailing conditions of my life. Paul and Silas are thrown in prison. They're beaten because, well, the climate where they were was antagonistic toward Christianity, toward Jesus. They wouldn't give up. They said, no, we are going to preach about Jesus Christ. So there they are in the inner hold. You see, the trick is don't let the world's climate get into you. You bring God's climate into the world. Hallelujah. So all the other prisons are listening and they've they know what's going on, word travels fast, and there's 
Paul and Silas, they're beaten, they're destitute, they don't know what's going to happen. And we read this in Acts 15, verse 16, verse 25. But at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God. And the prisoners were listening to them. They decided, we are going to set the atmosphere. We are going to serve God. No matter what's going on out there or what's going on inside everybody else, we're going to set an atmosphere of liberty. And of course, they had a great, uh, a great event. They were sprung from jail. God did a lot of things and more people got saved. Let's come to our final point. Your dominant atmosphere determines what grows in your life. Let me just get really personal. What are you watching? What are you listening to? What are you thinking about? Because your climate comes from outside. And if those answers are answers like to those questions I don't really like, and you wonder why nothing much is growing spiritually in your life, you need to stand up. You need to say, with God's help, I'm going to get with some other Christians, and I'm going to change the whole climate of my house, my job, my life. You know what I probably could do this afternoon? I could uh, go to the store and buy a juicy, beautiful pink grapefruit, cut into it, enjoy it, and then get the seeds. You know what I think I could do? I think I could go somewhere in my yard and dig up a little patch of ground, and I could plant grapefruit seeds. And I happen to believe that if I do it, they would germinate, and pretty soon I'd have some sprouts. I would have something coming up that had the potential to be a grapefruit tree. Except the climate's not right for that. Can anybody say a woeful amen? <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not living in Southern California. I'm not living at the equator. And so the climate will determine whether or not those things can grow. Whatever is in your life is going to produce something or another. And your dominant, your dominant climate, I'm not talking about, okay, I've come to church on Sunday. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being here. But you need more than one dose a week. You can have a little windstorm one day a week, and that's not a climate. A climate is what prevails in your life. And whatever prevails in your life is going to bear some fruit. And then your atmosphere is going to affect everybody around you. So if actually I could pull off the grapefruit thing and invite my neighbors over for fresh-grown grapefruit in January, that would make a pretty big splash, wouldn't it? Well, I can't do that in the natural, but there are some things I can do in the spiritual that will cause some fruit to grow that other people get to eat. Notice the atmosphere at the end of this story. Luke 5, 26. And they were all amazed, and they glorified God and were filled with fear, saying, we have seen strange things today. Strange. Paradoxus. We get our word paradox. Something happened they weren't expecting whatsoever. I mean, there's a son of man healing a man, a man they thought was a sinner forgiving sins, somebody with an incurable disease in a heartbeat undeniably was healed right in front of them. There was something that grew in that environment is what I'm saying. As we close, I want to tell you this. You can enjoy the atmosphere of heaven because Jesus will always make a way for you. Are you the man on the mat? People have been praying for you. They just so much want you to know Jesus Christ or to have another touch. Suspended, as it were, right now in a moment in time. And frankly, there are those voices that would just as soon you stay crippled, you stay confined, you remain unforgiven. They would be quite happy 
There would be no disruption to the status quo if that were your status. But then there's Jesus Christ who's saying, I'll change it all. I'll change it all because heaven will change you. Today, heaven can change you because Jesus Christ can change you. I would like everybody to stand, please. Don't go anywhere. Just be in prayer. Our prayer teams can come forward. Would you pray with me? Bow our heads. Close our eyes. Father, we thank you that Jesus Christ does change all things. We thank you, God, that we don't have to be blended in so much to the climate of the world that nothing grows in our lives, but instead we can be fruitful, that you can do things abundantly in our lives. So God, as we are here in a moment of truth, we offer our hearts, our lives, and our minds to you in Jesus' name. Without anybody looking around, and just as we stand, we're all together here, we're all standing. If you say, I need God's climate to prevail in my life, that can mean a lot of different things. And I'm going to pray with you right where you stand, but I'd like to see your hand if you say, you know what, I need, I need God's climate to prevail. Just put a hand up. Just put a hand up. I'm just kind of watching. What all of us need to know is a bunch of us have a hand in there, and that's, that's amazing. That's so good. Jesus said once, if you ask the Father for a good thing, you won't get a bad thing. You're going to get a good thing. Some of you, you're dealing with sin right now. How many of you say, I just have a sin in my life? And I need to get rid of it. Put a hand up. Just say, my problem is a sin problem at the very core, at the very root of it all. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for raising those hands. Put them down. Put them all down. Here's what we're going to do. In a moment, I'm going to close. I'm going to say the amen. And after that, if you want to come and pray with somebody, I encourage you to come up and let somebody pray with you and agree with you about your life, your situation. You desperately need to do this with other people. So we throw it open for whatever the need is. Meanwhile, let's all pray a very simple sinner's prayer. Everybody, out of deference to the people that did raise a hand, I want everybody here to pray this way. Dear God, I come to you now because I need a change. And I cannot change myself. I need your power to work in me and to work on me so that I'm a new person. I have sinned and I ask Jesus Christ right now to forgive me. Jesus, come into my life. You died for me and rose again and I make you my Lord and my Savior. Thank you that I'm forgiven. Direct my steps from this moment onward. And Lord, I pray that the atmosphere of my life and my home will be the atmosphere of heaven. Thank you in Jesus' name. And Father, we do thank you for these moments we've had. And as we leave, oh God, we want to take a piece of heaven with us wherever we go. Bless your people. Confirm your will to them. For those that are seeking you, may they be found of you. Lord, rejoice over each one this day and this week. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a great day. Good to see you. Feel free to come forward if you'd like to get prayer.